Good morning, everybody. My name is Ryan Davis. I'm Associate Vice President of Institutional Equity and Diversity here at Brown. It is my pleasure to welcome you to Professional Development Day. Um, you know, I want to take a moment just to frame the day before we get started here. And for the past few years, this day has really been reserved for each of us um, as an opportunity for faculty and staff around campus to gain a breadth and depth of knowledge around uh, topics related to diversity and inclusion. And so we are really excited that under the leadership of Vice President Shante Delalu, that our participation around this day has grown tremendously over the last few years. And this year, we're excited to report that we have over 550 registrants for Professional Development Day. And before we go any further, I'd like to make sure that we acknowledge the Planning Committee for all their hard work for putting this day together. Um, and so I'm going to name the nine people of the Planning Committee and then again join me for a round of applause. Uh, our Chair, Marlena Duncan, uh, Maya Hallsmith, Judy Knapp, Chloe Poston, Ruth Rosenberg, Catherine Smith, Kevin Kwashi, Sarah Walker, and Raymond Windsor. Please join me in giving them a thunderous round of applause. And I also want to acknowledge four other groups of people before we move on and get the day kicked off. Um, one of those groups is um, uh, our Office of Office of Institutional Equity and Diversity. Uh, the second group is um, the media, and third group is the event services. And lastly, but certainly not least, those who have agreed to facilitate our breakout sessions later this afternoon. Give them a round of applause for me. This year, our theme for this year is building community through inclusive practices. And each session has been intentionally designed around this theme to really focus on the individual, your role in creating crafting community. And so with this in mind, I invite each of you to approach um, your learning in, the, in these sessions with sort of an ability to deeply reflect on how you can sort of abstract what you're engaging in and, and apply this to not only your professional lives, but also your personal lives. Um, and so without further ado, we're going to go ahead and jump right into the day. And I would like to invite the chair of the planning committee, Dean Marlena Duncan, up to the stage to introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you, Ryan. Good morning. It is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Amakongo Dabinga. He is a motivational speaker, trilingual poet, TV talk show host, rapper, and professor of cross-cultural communication at American University in Washington, DC. Amakongo has published seven books, seven music fusion motivational CDs, and one independent film. His writings and performances have appeared in O Magazine, as well as on TV and radio outlets such as CNN, BET, and NPR. He has written songs for major motion pictures, as well as organized, such, uh, organized songs for uh, NASA and the Enough Project. Amakongo is an advocate for youth rights. He has spoken before the United Nations, partnered with the State Department to conduct youth leadership trainings, and speaks at student conferences around the country. He is not only doing this amazing work here in the US, but internationally, he has shared his work with over 20 countries on three continents. We are very lucky to have him here today, um, given his very busy schedule. And he's going to help the Brown community find common ground in uncommon times. I present to you Dr. Omakange Dabinga. When I was young, 
When I was young, they used to call me a monster, African, bushman, monkey, I was bothered. Used to pick on my clothes, I didn't have Nikes. I didn't have nice bikes, other fancy things. I didn't have much loot, no savings, no trust fund. So walking out my house every day was not fun. Had no heat in the winter, no AC in the hot sun. Next to my bed was rats, leftovers, they got some. Used to wonder why me while seeing on TV, dudes with Beamers, Jaguars, of course Mercedes. Being broke as a kid used to drive me crazy. Hearing the guns at night, couldn't sleep like a baby. But now I'll make it plain. I'm writing this on a plane on my way to Rhode Island for a show. What changed? Well, I stopped making excuses for myself, took blame. You take control of your life and you can do the same. Don't matter, you've been abused. Grew up with no parents. You dealt with booze, dealt with drugs, wheelchair ramped it. Maybe you grew up poor in a house, not a home. Maybe mom's was an addict, pop a rolling stone. What you gotta see is life is just testing you out to see if you'll take your life, take the easy route, to see if you'll. Throw the towel and surrender your soul to a life of crime, a life of loss, life out of control. But if you take a step back, think twice, get some goals. If you focus on your dreams and not your nightmares, yo, you'll see your life get better with your new mindset. Get new experiences that you won't regret. I took control of my life, now I travel the globe. I met Clinton, Obama, Maya Angelou. I might be the next man on the cover of O. You take control of your destiny, you never know. I've been on BET, BBC, CNN. I've been to 25 countries, spoke before me. Now they don't call me a monster lest I'm beast in the flow. They don't call me nothing but the goat at a show. So what can you do if you focus on great? More than me probably if you concentrate. Get the haters out your life. Stop lifting dead weight. And listen to no one who ever said wait. You take control of your dreams and develop yourself. If you eat the right foods and develop your health, you live the life of your dreams. Trust me, you'll see. Because you have nothing but greatness in your destiny. Good morning. Hey, what's up? All right, all right, all right. <clears throat> Good morning. Let's try it again. Good morning. Somebody repeat after me. There can only be one me. There was no me before me. There will be no me after me. And since I'm the only me that the world will see, I will be the best me that I can be. Give yourselves a round of applause. <clears throat> so like my number one goal was to turn all y'all into rappers and I just did that. So like what y'all do today? We rap, ma. So it's like we can do that too. We're just testing new boundaries and stuff, right? I'm really excited to be here and just share this idea, my thoughts as it relates to finding common ground in uncommon times and share my thoughts as it relates to my own path on this journey we call uh, diversity and inclusion. I've been reading a lot about the work that you all are doing here, uh, your DIAP program, and I've been really fascinated by the six components of it. When you talk about dealing with, as it relates to diversity and inclusion, when you're talking about people, when you're talking about the academics, when you're talking about the community, the curriculum, the knowledge and accountability. You know, today when we're looking at the, the work we're gonna be doing, not just now, but in a larger session, I really want us to spend time on that accountability piece as well as what we're gonna look at later in some of the other parts of the description of what we're gonna do about today is dealing with areas of awareness. Because we can talk about all of the issues and all of the challenges of the things that are going on in this world, but the real question becomes what are you doing in your daily life to help make a difference in the challenges that we face? Because we can talk about the problem all day, but we have to do the work as it relates to being part of the solution and our students are depending on us to do that. But if we're not gonna be part of that journey, it's not something we can never, we, it's not something we can never do. If we're not gonna be honest about ourselves, if we're not gonna challenge ourselves, if we're not, not, not going to look at our backgrounds to see where we are on this journey, then we're doing our, our, our fellow staff members, our fellow faculty members and our students a disservice. So let's talk about it. So my name, can I tell you a little story, a little bit? A little bit, okay. So my name, because we talk about the journey, so I'm gonna share a little bit about my journey. My question as I'm talking to you about my journey, I need you to tell me where you are in yours. Because one of the things we're gonna do in our breakout session is really spend time looking at the levels of this journey. So my journey starts with my name. My full name, it can't fit on Twitter, right? So even with the 280 characters, there's still not enough space. So my full name is Ome Kongo Luhaka Wadabingo Wangaka Kese Washington Kasa, right? 
Couldn't fit on the birth certificate either, so they just swam with Ome Congo and the Binga, right? Now, as you can tell from my name, I was born in a very far away place called Boston, Massachusetts. Oh. Well, it's far from here. I don't think you're gonna walk there, you know, but so, but for me, I didn't grow up with what you would call a stereotypical African accent, right? So you wouldn't know that my parents are of Congolese origin until you heard me speak my name. So I was walking around feeling like I was like everybody else until I went to school. School, yes, not out in the hood, in the schools, and started hearing things like, oh, you're an African bush boogie, you're an African booty scratcher. My geographically challenged friends would call me a Haitian butt scratcher because they thought like Haiti was an African needed more geography, but it's all good, remedial, but it's all good. But, but for me, it's like I got that first instance of living in this country that I was different and that I didn't belong here. And y'all look too young to remember like the 90s. But so it was like, you had to be there, you had to be there. But y'all remember like Public Enemy and like the old Flavor Flav and like just the old one, just the old one. Like I missed that dude. And, and you know, X-Clan and stuff. So for me, because people were disrespecting my background and my culture, and this included my teachers. This included the school I was at. You see, in my school, high school, actually for my school, it was seventh grade to 12th grade. So it was you know, middle school all the way through high school. Through that time, and some of y'all may have heard of this school since we're in New England, Boston Latin School. Yes, 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 okay. Got family, some company here, right? See, I went through that whole seven year process and read one book by a black author, which was conveniently called Invisible Man, <laughs> which is like, it's about me. So, you know, it, that's how I felt. Didn't see myself represented in the curriculum. Didn't see myself represented in the faculty. And then I'm dealing with situations where people are telling me all of these negative things about where I'm from. And so that's why I kind of went overboard when I saw groups like rap groups like Public Enemy and X-Clan going heavy on the red, black, and green showcasing my African identity because everywhere I looked, people were telling me that Africa was negative. And let's not even talk about the television. I mean, we know on TV, the media could only deal with like one African conflict per decade, right? So in like the 80s, it was Ethiopia. In the 90s, it was Rwanda. Then the year after that, the decade after that, it was Sudan. And now like, you know, Congo's fighting for that little 30 seconds and, you know, Libya's fighting for it. It got really ridiculous. So everywhere I went, I was not represented. And it's unfortunate because even when I got to the university level as a student, I didn't find the representation that I needed. And that's what led me to a lot of this work because I got tired of being in spaces where I didn't see other black men represented heavily. I got tired of being in spaces where I didn't see black authors, you know, male or female represented heavily. And so I felt like I needed to be the type of person that I needed to see as a student, which led to me doing this work which led to me also bringing my music into these academic spaces because a lot of kids who come into schools feel like they have to lose their creativity in order to become these great students. And I wanted to show them that you can kind of be yourself and still do this work. Here's a question I want to ask you. Are you bringing your authentic self to work every day? Are you in a space where you feel like you can be who you are showcase who you are, bring out your full talents, or are you just kind of going through the motions because you're afraid to rock the boat? What I love about being here today and the work that you all are doing, and I speak at a lot of colleges, and, uh, and you can feel like this university is, is doing a lot. You could feel like it's not doing enough, but what I will tell you is that the things that you all are engaged in here are not happening at this level at many universities across the country. So this is a space where you can engage. This is a space where you can pull out your authentic self and use that towards building a community that is truly inclusive. This is why this work is done every year. But if you're gonna come to this space every year and kind of shy away from bringing out your talents, from bringing out who you are, from embracing who you are, you're doing everybody a disservice. And we don't want that to happen.
So what I want to talk about today is I want to give you all five little techniques of what you can do as it relates to building on your own what we will call cultural competency so we can finally get to that place of finding common ground in uncommon times. Because if we can start to realize that, yes, we are different, but in the difference there is beauty. And even within the difference, there are more things that pull us together than, we do, that, than they are that separate us. We can build on this mission of diversity and inclusion that Brown has set upon. So I want to share these things with you. And for those of y'all who will be in the session, we'll go deeper in them. But even if you're not in the session, these are very simple techniques that you can take away with you. So let's, the first step is, is B. Everybody say, be aware. Be aware. Say it like you mean it. Be aware. You see, when the people were picking on me and beating me up, and you know, we were, I would wear African jewelry to school and people would like throw rocks at us and punch me in the face and all that other type of stuff, I always asked myself, are they aware of what's going on in their minds? Some of y'all heard the phrase before that hurt people hurt people. I wonder if they were aware that they were, why they were projecting such hate onto me. And a lot of them, I felt like, weren't really aware, but I was like the outlet for them because I was easy to pick on. I was a very quiet type of person, didn't speak much. I wasn't a rock-the-boat type of person. So I realized that they weren't aware, but it started making me more aware. I started becoming more observant of people. So when I say be aware, I need you all to start paying attention to what the people who are around you might be going through as well on their journey as it relates to finding common ground. Because we may be having our own challenges, but if we're gonna be mindful about the work that we're doing, we also have to be aware of what the other people might be going through who are sitting next to us. I speak to a lot of kids, high schools, middle schools. I work with schools on like teaching black boys and all this other type of stuff. And sometimes we just do anti-bullying work. And I tell the kids in, my, in the schools, like you can literally be sitting next to somebody who was a child soldier from another country. You can literally be sitting next to somebody who has been trafficked sexually in this country, right? Like, what are you doing? Are you, are you so caught up in what's going on in your own space that you're not making the time to understand what's going on in the spaces of others? Are you aware of the microaggressions, the things that you might be saying that could affect somebody else's space? Oh, you're really good at math for a girl. Oh, you're a really great dancer for a white dude. Like, you know, like, are you aware of those things? Like those little things we think are funny can be hitting people at their core. Those kids weren't aware. We are adults. We gotta start doing that work. Because trust me, the students that you interact with, the other staff who are not here, or you, they feel it. So that's what I mean when I say be aware. All right, the next step is release. Everybody say release. release. Say it like you mean a release. release. You got to release preconceived notions that you have about people. You got to release preconceived notions about that you have about people, how do you do that? Well, number one, you gotta check your media sources. Where do you consume information about pe uh, different types of people? You know, the Washington Post reported in 2014 that the majority of white people have no black friends. This was just six years ago, like 75% of people. And it's not like, you know, people working for you. I'm talking about like friends, like go to dinner, go to the club, like all that type of stuff, none. So I would ask that group, where are you learning about black people from? And then, you know, black people I encounter who have no white friends, I would ask them, how are you getting your information? You see, most of us, if we're not interacting with different groups, we're getting our information from the media. But here's the challenge with our media today. In our 24-hour news cycle that we have, most of the information you're gonna see is repeat, is repetitive. It doesn't give you real stories that are dealing with real people on the ground on a regular basis. And because of social media and all of these other things, we can create our own echo sphere, where, our own echo chamber, where we don't have to go and learn about other things. We can stick to our same news sources every single day. So how are you going to release preconceived notions if all you do is watch the same sources every day? You only watch Wolf Blitzer. You only watch Rachel Maddow. You only watch Tucker Carlson. You only read, you know, The Root. Or you only read Slate. Or you only read what? We got to start releasing preconceived notions by going to other sources because unfortunately, too many of us are in a situation now where we don't go to the internet or the media looking for information. We go looking for affirmation. 
we go looking for people to affirm what we already think about people. So if you have a preconceived notion about white people or Mexicans or women or Muslims or Christians, you can find any source that's going to help you validate that, that line of thinking. And you're going to bring that into your workspaces before you actually give yourself an opportunity to communicate with your colleagues. On my first day of classes at American University, I always tell students, I don't care what you think about anything. I don't care what you think about any issue going on in the world. What I care about is how you think. I care about how you are informed because we're dealing with a society now where critical thinking is not taught anymore. So I told you, you gotta get out of your box because we're living in this society. Oh, I'm gonna give you all a word, some of y'all. Anyone ever heard this word, agnotology? Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. It's like class, yes. So. This is the, so agnotology is the study of how doubt is produced. Think about the smoking industry, right? So agnotology, A-G, I feel like fabulous, A-G-N-O-T-O. -O. Okay, so A-G, <laughs> agnotology, right? Just as it sounds, A-G-N-O-T-O-L-O-G-Y. It's the study of how doubt is produced. Think about the smoking industry. So when the smoking industry realized that they couldn't refute the research about the negative uh, effects of smoking, what did they do? Just start creating doubt. You start getting like camels and cartoons and pictures and stuff. You start getting uh, celebrities, you know, with the cigarettes because if your favorite celebrity has a cigarette, what, how could it be bad? Y'all understand what I'm saying? So rather than argue with the facts, you just create doubt. That's what we're living in today. When people talk about, and I don't care who you support, you know, politically, that, that's your business. But when people, you know, use terminology like fake news and alternative facts, that's what people mean when they're creating doubt. Because if all you do is doubt, you don't have to think. You don't have to challenge. But if we really want to talk about building diverse and inclusive cultures, we have to go beyond that. Because we're dealing with a media that, is, that targets groups. And you have to be better than that. And so if you want to release your preconceived notions, I'm going to ask you, who's on your reading list? Do you have a reading list? Right? As it relates to doing this work, are people like Ibram Kendi on, 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 on your reading list? Like, what, what are you doing to, or, or the videos? Who, what are you listening to? Who's in your music collection? Who's on your phone? What movies are you going to see? Every single day, we have an opportunity to do something different to help us release those preconceived notions, which leads us to the next step, overcome. Everybody say overcome. overcome. Say it like you mean it, overcome. overcome. You got to overcome your fears. Doing this work can be scary. Challenging your preconceived notions, becoming aware of what's going on around you, engaging in courageous conversations about this stuff, it can be scary. You could become a social media trending topic for saying the wrong thing. And people have, you know, calling Brown and saying, how could you let this person work here? They said this, they said that, or whatever. But here's how you overcome your fear. Number one, you have to realize, as Ziegler said, that fear is just spelled F-E-A-R. And all it means is false evidence appearing real. Right? Some people say it means forget everything and run. I don't like that one. I don't like that one. That's not what we're doing here. You know, false evidence appearing real. Most of the things you're going to worry about are not going to happen. You know, I, just do, get out there and do the work. Just get out there and do the work because you're going to find the like-minded people who want to do this work with you. So you got to be fearless in this work. If, if people who came before us were not fearless in their work, some of us, depending on where you go back to in time, wouldn't be able to be here as students, as faculty, as staff at Brown University, whether we're talking women, whether we're talking black people, whatever. But people were fearless and did the work. So if they were fearless then, why were we going to have fear now? So you got to overcome that and understand that they're like-minded people because if your dream is big enough, then the problems don't matter. If your goal is big enough, then the problems don't matter. I've been dealing with this uncomfortable thing with like a fear of like flying, right? Like I'm like, 
I got to fly to get here, right? It's just like a thing. Y'all remember the Golden Girls? Y'all too young? Okay. So, and so, so B. Arthur was like my favorite character, right? And so uh, Dorothy. And so she had this fear of flying, but they had to go to a funeral. And she was so shook when they got on the plane, she was like, don't even look at me to talk to me because it's going to shake the plane, right? So that was kind of like me. But my goal to do this work is bigger. So you have to make your goals, your dreams bigger than your fears. And when you do that, especially as a community, we're able to get to that next level. Which leads me to this thing we call wonder. Everybody say wonder. wonder. You have to have a spirit of curiosity to do this work. You can't just walk around and just say you're an expert in this field, you do this work, you got it all figured out, because there's always going to be something that's going to get you. And as we used to say in the hood, you don't want to get got, right? <laughs> Especially nowadays. Because nowadays, people are not quick to give you second chances. In this what we call cancel culture, people are quick to rather, you know, just get you fired and get you out of a position than give you a chance to redeem yourself. But if you have a sense of wonder, you're always open to new things. So I consider myself, for example, to be proficient in areas relating to race, right? But, and diversity overall, but, I, but I'm not comfortable because there's always new things that get added to the conversation. Case in point, transgender community. For y'all who are in this work like myself as diversity practitioners, if we're honest, we know that co adding conversations about the transgender community in the workplace and school, that's a fairly new phenomenon, maybe like the last seven or eight years. I'm not saying the research hasn't been done and people haven't written about it. I'm just talking about adding it seriously to the field because people were comfortable in their own spaces and people didn't want to learn more about a different group. But you have to have a sense of wonder because that's going to help you be open to learning about new groups and, and remembering that you got two ears and one mouth and you're supposed to use them in proportion, right? As practitioners, as faculty, as staff, as leaders, we're supposed to do more listening than we do talking. And that sense of wonder will help us do that, which leads us to never give up. Everybody say never give up. You got to never give up, y'all. We can't get comfortable because our comfort zone is our danger zone. We have to keep doing this work because there's always going to be people who need us. There's always going to be people who are going to feel like they don't belong. And we have to help them by doing the work daily to create communities where everybody feels celebrated and not tolerated. So I want you to think in the spaces that you occupy, here at Brown, are you celebrating people? Or are you tolerating people? Do you feel celebrated or do you feel tolerated? See, when we talk about this work, you have to remember, sometimes what we give is, anybody? It's what you get. Sometimes we got to do the work to look at the energy that we're putting out and see if we need to make those individual shifts to get the reciprocity that we feel that we want. So I gave you that be aware. That's B. Check this out. I gave you that be aware. That's B. I gave you that release preconceived notions. That's R. I gave you that overcome. That's O. I gave you that W. That's wonder. That's W. And I gave you that N for never give up. I introduced today the Brown method to you all. You like that? You like that? So check it, right? So <laughs> that should make it very easy for you to remember that. You know, we just call it the Brown method. Yo, you live in your Brown method today? So y'all can make like t-shirts and all that stuff, right? But you know, <laughs> seriously, you, know, you have to ask yourself this question, right? If you're not going to do it, who will? If you're not going to take the lead, who will? And it doesn't matter whether you're in reception, whether you're in HR, whether you're a director of a department, whether you're anything. You woke up breathing, you got work to do. Don't get comfortable. 
get out there. Do this work because you all can continue to be a leader, not just in this country, but across the globe as it relates to what it really means to do this work. And you got to understand, unfortunately, and again, I don't care who your political affiliation is to, but if you're honest, regardless of where you stand politically, between now and November, it's only going to get worse before it gets better as it relates to our political climate. That's a reality. So since we know that, doing nothing is not an option. We have to get out there and do the work because not only is our university on the line, but our country is on the line. And we are creating future leaders. American people are going to lead in America and people are going to lead across the globe. And you all in this room are on the front lines of helping our students bring out their greatness. But we have to believe that it's possible. We have to leave our past in the past with those preconceived notions and start doing better because it's all about the future. They say our children, I believe it was Elijah Cummings who said, our, our children are the messages that we send to a future that we will not see. The work that you all are doing today and have been doing in the past and will continue to do are helping send positive, incredible students to a bright future that they are going to lead. And we just got to believe. Everybody repeat after me. I know if I believe, I can and will achieve. The past is the past. I will no longer regret it. I will focus on my own gifts, which I call the present. I will get out of my own way and live my best life starting today. If I focus on my dreams and not my sorrows, my trials today will be my testimony tomorrow. So I'm hoping you all today, as you go through the work, as you go through all of your workshops, as you maybe meet new people, we start looking at ways to turn our, our trials into testimonies, our problems into possibilities, our obstacles into opportunities, so we can really start building this inclusive community. I believe that in doing that, we bring out the greatness that is in us, we bring out the greatness that is in people around us, and we bring out the greatness that is in our students. And so this last poem I'm gonna share with you all is just a little tribute to your greatness, and it's simply called grow towards your greatness are we good all right because I like ending with positive things because positivity is good they say that greatness is a choice but what have you chosen you've been frozen in time and broken in mind for too long the same song playing in your head living in breath but better off dead but who said that you didn't have the power who said this is not your hour? You've been showered with a steady stream of words that kill your dreams. But since you're still breathing, then someone has lied to you, tried to deny you of your own potential inside you. If you just decide to, let no one deride you. Don't even let them get beside you as you unearth the new you. Stop listening to naysayers and decide to do you. No more pity parties, sob stories, and boo-hoos. If no one told you that you're great, then let me be the first to. If you develop the thirst to drink from face fountain, you'll develop the might to move mountains. You see, we remove tons of dirt to find one ounce of gold. So I ask you to remove tons of hurt and just uncover one ounce of your soul. You'll set yourself on a true path of excellence, getting out of your passenger seat and driving your own car, reaching for the moon but maybe only landing among the stars. You see, you have greatness inside you, but you must choose to be great. Blaze a path of excellence, leaving fear in your wake. All you need is already inside you. You just must believe in yourself. Grow towards your greatness and discover your true wealth. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you so much for that message. We, I love the brown way. We have to remember that and, and keep using that. 
um, and definitely move towards our greatness. So we're gonna shift gears um, to our conversation with university leaders. So in the past, during the OIED professional development days, the president and provost would present on the DIAP goals for the year. So this year we're gonna do something a little different. Um, we're gonna have Renee Davis, our Title IX program officer, is going to moderate a conversation with the provost and president, and they're going to talk about our theme for the day, building community through inclusive practices. What are the opportunities, what are the challenges, and how is this work important to them both professionally and personally? So please help me welcome to the stage President Paxton, Provost Locke, and Renee Davis. That was fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. my best Oprah life as a moderator. <laughs> <laughs> so, so thank you. Um, I'm excited for this, this new format. We're going to keep up the energy of the presentation. And so our keynote kicked us off really well by talking about journeys and, and how he came to different experiences that led him on his path of being an educator and, um, and a performer. So can you just talk to us a bit about your journey? and some opportunities or some experiences that you have had that has led you to talk about the value and the importance of diversity and inclusion. So I'll start, and thank you, and thank you for a fantastic keynote. Thank you so much. So I, um, I, I'm, I'm gonna tell you a story or two maybe, but I thought I'd start by picking up this idea of a journey mm -hmm. and the idea that it's not ever over. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important, you know, and we'd like to think that, you know, we go through life and all of a sudden we have this aha, pivotal moment and suddenly the lights come on and mm -hmm. we're, we're done, mm -hmm. right? It's not how it works. Mm -hmm. So what I've loved about this work is the ability to keep learning and growing and changing all the time. And that's what makes it exciting and that means you gotta keep going, mm -hmm. right? So just a little bit of background about myself. I'm an economist. Uh, for those of you who have been around the university a while or in academics, you know that this is a very male field. Mm -hmm. So when I was a new assistant professor, I, I got my job, you know, applied for a job. I went to Princeton University. And I thought I was going into a great situation because there were three women. Well, I was the third woman in the department. There were two other assistant professors. And about two-thirds of the way through the year, they came to me and told me they were both leaving. Mm. So I was the only one. <laughs> and I was the only one for a while, and then finally another came, and there were two of us again. But it was, it, you know, I have to say, and there's been a lot of work done recently about the status of women in economics, and it's not a pretty picture. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was really hard. Now, here's where I think the lesson is, and one of, again, I would take it back to that great keynote, which is, Sometimes you just have to do it yourself, right? And so I was given the opportunity to start a research center from scratch. It was a research center on health and well-being, multidisciplinary people from all different fields. And so it was like, I could, I'm gonna hire people, I'm gonna invite faculty to be part of this. And without really, I don't know, did I do it consciously, unconsciously, I don't know. But the center that I built was incredibly diverse. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of women there. In fact, so much so that people would come onto the floor. We had one big floor of a building, and they'd say, like, where are all the men? And I thought, OK, well, actually, it was about 50-50. But often, when it's 50-50, people say, where are all the men? Because they're used to having more than 50% of them, right? And, and so that, that was just a really good experience for me of saying, OK, you, know, you, can, you can actually jump in and build the community that you want to see. And that's really great. I went, we're actually heading into, I'm going to go to a dinner this spring for the, I, I was shocked when I got this invitation. It's the 20th anniversary of the founding of the center. I feel so old. <laughs> but I'm going to go back for that. So I looked on their website, and I looked at the list of faculty and staff, and guess what? It's about 53% women. Mm -hmm. And it's also incredibly diverse racially, ethnically. And I thought, okay, you know, something about getting it set right at the beginning 
persisted over time. Mm -hmm. That was fantastic. So that's my, my story. I can tell you other stories, but the provost has great stories too. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, so first of all, thank you all uh, for, for being here today. It's really terrific, and thanks for OID and others for organizing this event. It's really, really uh, terrific. Um, so I grew up in Boston, too, uh, and Boston is a very segregated city. Uh, I um, uh, came from a, a working class uh, background, and so I was aware of certain differences at a personal level and uh, on other differences at an intellectual level. So uh, because I came from a working class background, I was very aware of class, uh, of socioeconomic class and how different class, uh, different people from different socioeconomic classes had different opportunities. And my neighborhood had sort of religious and maybe ethnic diversity, but not racial diversity, because Boston's very segregated. And so the, to the extent that I thought about that, it was like, what the hell is going on in that other neighborhood, South Boston, around busing? You know, what are those people doing? So it was just sort of something distant. It wasn't at home. Um, you know, we cared about class, we cared about other kinds of differences, but not so much, uh, you know, race was at an intellectual uh, level, it wasn't a personal level. And that continued, uh, even when I went to college, I was the first one in my family to go to uh, four-year college, and I remember thinking, wow, you know, that, that book by uh, Samuel Bowles and Herbert Gintis, uh, uh, Schooling in Capitalist America, it's all about the reproduction in, of class through the education system. And I saw how it was difficult to navigate being in college, trying to do well, having to work, um, and, um, and seeing people with very, very different uh, life choices than I had. But the issue, and again, issues of racial diversity, inclusion, et cetera, it was something that you know, I, I thought, oh yeah, I get it, but I actually realized I didn't get it. It was more of an intellectual uh, thing. And that changed after college. And I would say that there's two experiences that I had, more, one more recent and one right out of college that actually brought it home, brought home the importance of this journey, the importance of the work, the importance of bringing it to a personal level. Uh, so right out of college, um, I got a job teaching social studies um, in a high school in Chicago. Uh, and I went part-time, uh, got my master's part-time at the University of Chicago. And um, it was uh, during Harold Washington's first mayoral campaign. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who don't know, Harold Washington was the first black mayor of Chicago, and I canvassed for him. And so I, I taught social studies in the day. I went to classes at night. Um, but uh, during the free time, I canvassed for him, and because I was, you know, this white boy, you know, they sent me to the, uh, you know, white neighborhoods uh, to canvass, and it was, and, and Chicago is a completely democratic city, but this became a very close race. Uh, there's like almost nothing of a Republican candidate almost won uh, against Harold Washington, so you could tell what the racial pressures were. And I would canvass, and people would spit at me, they would punch me, they would push me, they would you know sort of do all this stuff because I was canvassing for this um, black mayoral candidate who fortunately won. Uh, and because I lived in Hyde Park, which is a predominantly uh, black neighborhood, uh, I what was so interesting is. You know, there was all this tension, and we like, and there was this hope, but there was all this fret, uh, you know, fretting about the the conflict and what was going to happen. And you know, again, it was unpleasant uh, to canvass in certain neighborhoods. But when he won, I remember being at the University of Chicago at the cafeteria, and the dining service workers, most of them uh, uh, black, they were playing music and they were dancing, and this joy, and in that combination of it's hard work and the resistance to change is real mm -hmm. and yet every now and then when it happens it just liberates people and it liberates the community and i felt like that was something that i realized yeah it's not an intellectual out there on tv thing it's actually something personal and that uh, started waking me up a bit and i guess the second more recent story and then i'll, I'll stop is what happened here so my First year as provost, 2015-2016, uh, uh, there was a lot of mobilization on campus uh, around issues of racism, diversity and inclusion, uh, white privilege, et cetera. Um, and um, I thought it was really important as someone who 
tries to be progressive and promote change uh, to go to listen to these different protests. Uh, sometimes those protests uh, turned on me. Uh, that wasn't uh, always very comfortable. But I thought it was really important to genuinely listen. And when I really listened, I realized how um, in small and not so small ways, so many members of our community were being undermined, were not being welcomed and being able to bring their authentic selves because of either microaggressions or sometimes macroaggressions, and that it was our responsibility to do something about it. And it was at that point that I realized we're in a position to actually make a change. I have a wonderful uh, partner uh, and a group of people, uh, all of us working together, and that this had to be not just a professional or intellectual exercise, it had to be the work uh, of me as a person and as a citizen. And that's how I think I began to, I think, wake up more fully to this work. And it is a journey, and I still have a ton to do uh, to learn, and I still make all the mistakes, but I'm hoping to correct them with time. Thank you, thank you both. Um, I think you both, as well as our keynote, really talked about um, diversity and inclusion from a perspective of insider and outsider experiences. And I think that the diversity and inclusion action planning is, is a process that embeds inclusion work um, at the departmental level in ways that make us feel really comfortable, in some ways that make us not feel comfortable. And so what do you all see as the strengths and challenges of that model, recognizing that we are all in different places within our journey and we have different leadership that's in different places within, within that journey. And so what do you all see as some of the, the strengths? So why that approach? Like why take that approach to um, making Brown um, be the Brown way and live up to our mission of inclusion? So, so let me talk a little bit about how I see the inclusion work within the DAP. And you know, we're, we're about to go into phase two of DAP planning, which I think is really, really important. And this is going to focus on the inclusion piece, which I think is in some ways harder than compositional diversity, much harder. So I, you know, I think the difference in how we're thinking about this is when we put together this diversity inclusion action plan, and again, I remember sitting in my living room with a big group of faculty talking to students, it was a very inclusive process, which was great. But the real, the thing that, I, that bothered me the most was, okay, how can we have something that isn't just a top-down plan mm -hmm. that then goes and sits on a shelf and you can pull it out 10 years later and say, why didn't we do this? Wait, what happened? Mm -hmm. and, and so the, the, the mechanism that we put in there was engage every department on campus. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of an audacious goal when you think about it. <laughs> and to put the responsibility on every department on campus to think and talk about inclusion and what that means, what it looks like for them. So, you know, this is part of the work that we're all in the middle of. And so we're demanding a lot of the community. I think it's, it's really important. I will say, you know, one, one thing that I think is an important part of the work of inclusion is being informed by data. Mm -hmm. And we're a university, right? We, we, we respect data, we respect facts, true facts, not other facts, alternative facts. And so, you know, <laughs> last year, we did this really great survey mm -hmm. of faculty, students, and staff on inclusion. And the results are, you know, they're really interesting. You can dig down to a very fine grain level. And for people who are skeptics, and I know there are people who are skeptics out there, you can say, look at this. How can you dismiss this? This is a problem. We have to, again, make sure that every student, every staff member, every faculty member who comes to this campus feels like they're treated with respect, like they're full partners in the mission, mm -hmm. and that they are gonna be able to be their full selves and grow professionally, that's what we're about. So it's the pushing things down, accompanied by data, and a lot of talking about it that I think is important for inclusion. Yeah, I, yeah just, just to add uh, quickly on this, um, when, uh, when Chris and I uh, and a whole team of people 
lots of faculty and students and staff and graduate students, we were all like iterating a lot in that, in that period, trying to develop uh, the plan, testing it out, getting feedback, um, bringing that together. And one of the things that we did is we actually read all the past plans, yeah. right? This isn't the first time that the university had a diversity and inclusion action plan. They had many since, you know, 68 and on. And when we went back and looked at those plans, they actually were great. They were good plans, good goals, good objectives, good uh, things like that. And so the question is, what happened? Like, why is it going to be different this time? Um, because, and you know, my reading of this, and I think our understanding of this was, good ideas. There was energy around them, and then you know, year two, year three, something else happened, and people got distracted and didn't uh, continue the work. And so we thought that. Um, let's uh, not repeat that again. And so the theory of change was not that it was gonna come from University Hall and imposed on others and then they could wait us out or, or something like that, but rather it had to be embedded throughout the university in each of the different departments. And that each of the departments would um, go on the journey, as, as our keynote speaker said, where they are and bring them on. Mm -hmm. And so that was really important and using data, et cetera. But I think what was so important is the only thing we asked them to do is to um, have conversations that brought everyone together. Mm -hmm. That was the only thing. We didn't tell them, like, set certain goals or do this. We said, you know, you're at different places. Figure out where you need to go. We'll read it. We'll give you feedback. But we want you to try to engage as many people as possible in the departments in the conversation because it's so difficult to have this conversation mm -hmm. for so many people. And if we could start having the conversation, then people would begin, it, it's just when I speak to sometimes the grad students, I'm like, what's going on? These faculty, you know, they don't get it. And I'm like, they're just awkward and weird. It's not like they're, it, 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 it's, not, it's not that they're against it. They're just, they're, it's, they don't have the vocabulary. They get nervous. They, they feel awkward. And then you're reading that nervousness and awkward as, as resistance. But it's actually, they don't know how to engage. Mm -hmm. And so if we could have those conversations, we could begin to get people into the conversation, begin to engage, and slowly but surely we'd bring about the cultural change. Mm -hmm. This is a 255-year-old institution. We've made a lot of progress on compositional diversity. We have a lot more to go. Changing the culture, the process, the practices of this institution is going to take a long time. And only all of us involved uh, can bring about that change. And, and I, I, I think you're absolutely right. That, and when I hear people often express frustration with the, with the plan, often it's around the pace of the change around what's happening within their departments. And I get that. You know, so, some departments, some units are going like gangbusters, and others are slower to start. And that's something we have to really pay careful attention to, because yeah. that's, that is the way we're going to have culture change at Brown. I agree, and if I, if I can add, I guess I'm moderating, I can do whatever you I want. You can add whatever you want. <laughs> you can say, you're allowed. <laughs> Well, um, what I would add is that I, I think in a diversity and inclusion model like this, we often focus on what we need to do, but we don't take moments to find our joy. And I, I think that's one of the things that we need to reflect on as we think about the diversity and inclusion plan. Like there's no, we talk about accomplishments, but we don't really celebrate our, our joy, find our joy. And so I think as a person who is a soldier in this work, I think we do have to take the moments to acknowledge just where we have come and, and take moments like Professional Development Day, plug, 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 um, to celebrate actually what we have accomplished as an institution. So I think that's true. And, and add to that, yeah. that's a really good point for our students. Mm -hmm. Most, like our students, the, the younger students were not around mm -hmm. when we started this process. And they often think that we have come nowhere because they haven't seen the change. They've only been here six months, right? right? right. So, so we have to do a good job <laughs> educating our students. And I love their passion, and I love the fact that they're always pushing us forward faster. Yes, but they, are. they don't always understand the accomplishments, right? Right, absolutely. Yeah. So as a part of uh, planning for Professional Development Day, we um, opened up this moment and this conversation to our community members to submit questions. And so we did have a few community members who submitted a few, and one community member wants to um, you know, take a moment to focus in on um, inclusion for individuals with disabilities or who are differently abled. 
And so one of the things that they noted, and I think we might have received two questions around this, is that we've recently changed some of the model around how faculty and staff ha um, are seeking accommodations. So can you all talk just very broadly about some of the current efforts that we're doing as an administration to really be inclusive of individuals um, with disabilities? And again, I would say not disability, but differently abled in, in terms of how we talk about in, um, diversity and inclusion. So how are they included in the conversation? So, so you know, it's interesting. I, I knew that this was going to be a topic of discussion. I was thinking about it. And in a way, I think, you know, again, I'm, I'm going to keep coming back to that great keynote speech when uh, you said, you know, seven or eight years ago, we weren't talking about gender non-binary and trans individuals. Mm -hmm. And we weren't. And I think a lot of the conversations about people with different abilities is relatively new. Mm -hmm. And so honestly, it's something I'm still learning about. Mm -hmm. I think some of the work that we've done, and I think we've come a long way, is around physical issues. Mm -hmm. And so you know, every time we do a renovation, every time we think about construction, we're very, very aware of how we can make sure that buildings are fully accessible. That's mm -hmm. really, really important. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think some of the issues around those less visibility, less visible disabilities mm -hmm. is an area where we need to do more work, and, and I acknowledge that. Uh, I think there was a change, and you know, again, this isn't something that happens at the president's level or the provost level, uh, where um, issues around uh, medical disability and medical leaves and short-term disability for staff mm -hmm. was moved to HR, which is where it is in most organizations. Mm -hmm. And in order to make sure we have the most professional, kind of comprehensive, up-to-date, responsive program possible, I believe that they subcontracted out with a firm that specializes in doing this. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like a great thing to do. Uh, like all things we do, I assume that we'll assess it and make sure it's working well and people are satisfied. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I don't know much about the reasoning or the genesis behind that. Mm -hmm. Amanda, is Amanda here? Amanda's Amanda, here. Amanda, do you want to say something about that? Um, sure, yeah. Um, good morning, everybody. Introduce yourself. <laughs> so everybody knows you. who you are. Yeah, Amanda <laughs> Bailey, head of HR, as I like to call it. Um, so yes, that's exactly right. We're, with respect to taking it to the next level and engaging our employees from an equity perspective and making sure that HR are doing our role of protecting the confidentiality of documents that come in, we were really excited to be able to shift the services to our team. Um, we know that finding through that competitive process of a vendor that we were able to move the more tactical pieces of the analysis to a reputable source of subject matter experts offsite that allowed our UHR team, which they do every day now, provide the more important consultation to make sure that that accommodation can be implemented. And we're assessing it um, every quarter so that we can report out. From the numbers, we think that this is a really great change because we've seen a um, high increase, not only in phone calls about what can be done, but in actual requests. So we're really thrilled about being able to do that. Thank you. And, and if I could just add, uh, I think as, as Chris mentioned, uh, we've done a lot of work and every time we do a renovation, we're trying to uh, address uh, people with uh, who are have uh, physical um, uh, uh, disabilities or uh, different ab abilities. But, um, and uh, our previous vice pro uh, associate provost for space actually had a whole plan to look at every building, uh, even the ones that we weren't renovating to really uh, address that. But on the larger issue of how to, how to be more aware and to better understand and respond to in a open, supportive way of people who have a variety of different uh, uh, abilities, um, I think we have a lot of work to do. And so there was a working group uh, that has, was put together. It had uh, Vanessa Brito uh, uh, chairing it, had people from OID, from Campus Life, uh, from my office. Um, and the plan was to actually roll out a whole series of training. Uh, for faculty and staff and have in the same way that we're talking about for the diversity and inclusion uh, work is to have departmental sort of almost champions reps so that people could go because again it's one of those things that people say 
how do I address this accommodation? How do I make sense of it? Well, you may not be an expert on it, but here someone is, and we have to become aware. Because our students, what's so wonderful is it's, it's true that it's not like people who are differently abled suddenly appeared, or people who are trans suddenly appeared. We're becoming more aware. Um, and fortunately, uh, people feel more comfortable um, expressing uh, their, uh, their differences. And so what we have to do is learn how to make sure that we cr create a truly supportive and inclusive environment for everyone. Um, and I think we're, we're in that pathway and we have a long way to go, but I think we're beginning to put in the infrastructure so that we can support people. I think that's fantastic. Can, can I tell you a personal story that really brought this home? And sometimes it is the personal that helps you understand how important things are. So when I first came to Brown, um, my father was still alive. And he had multiple sclerosis. And he moved to a nursing home near the campus. And I wanted to show him the campus. So we got, you know, got a car, got the wheelchair in the car, got to get him to campus. And I'm going around the main green. And I'm like, well, that building's nice, but we can't go in there. And my office is in that building, but we can't get there. And it just brought home to me the limitations of an 18th century campus and the need to make it better. So th those personal things sometimes help too. Yeah. I, think, I think that's yeah. fantastic. And I love the approach of talking about the accommodations process, which is a core component of it. But also, it's about inclusion and it's about belonging for people who have a, a different way of engaging with the university in a different way of connecting. So I, I appreciate yeah. your responses to that. We um, have a question from another community member who, um, again, is really sort of pushing us and pushing the university to think about becoming a truly inclusive community. And how, that, how can that happen when you have a curriculum or you have faculty and students talking about um, material or engaging in um, academic material that is so far removed from today's experiences or many of our lived experiences today. Um, and so how do, you, how do you respond to that when you know, some students or some individuals are feeling like our curriculum doesn't reflect the problems of today's society? So, so I would probably, I'm gonna disagree with that premise, but also agree with part of it. Okay. And let me see where it will go. Yeah. So you know, we're, part of our mission is to generate knowledge. That, I mean, actually a big part of our mission is to generate knowledge. If you look at the Brown mission statement, it is to you know, create, preserve, and communicate knowledge and understanding. Mm -hmm. And a lot of academic disciplines have high, sort of high thresholds to actually getting into the work. And again, I'll come back to my discipline economics. Our language is mathematics, right? And so if you walk into an economic seminar, a research seminar, and you don't know calculus, or statistics, you probably, it'll feel like you're not addressing the concerns that I have. But when you actually look at the substance of what's being done, we're considering issues of health disparities, issues of poverty, of inequality, things that are really important to society. So when I think about it, the question is, how do we take this knowledge and communicate it in a way that it is understandable to a much broader audience. Mm -hmm. And you know, we do this in lots of different ways, and I'm sure Rick can give examples too, but you know, one is we just created a broadcast media studio that I'm very excited about, and we're giving a bunch of faculty media training so they can talk about what they do mm -hmm. to the broader world. That's fantastic. Uh, we have started, and I'll let uh, the provost talk about this, the faculty uh, staff seminar series where faculty are talking about their work to staff. Mm -hmm. uh, I host a series where faculty talk to about their the presidential faculty award lectures, but they talk about their work to broad audiences, not just to their own peers. Mm -hmm. And that kind of forces them to speak in plain English, mm -hmm. which is kind of a good thing. <laughs> So, so I guess I, you know, we have to continue with doing this academic work at the cutting edge of whatever discipline it is we're in. Mm -hmm. But we do have a responsibility to communicate about it, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I, th I think my, my views are, again, complementary to what Chris says. The first is to acknowledge um, the, that question, that comment, which is, uh, most of our society sees universities completely out of touch. Mm -hmm. You know, isolated echo chambers, um, do our own thing, you know, you know, but not really relevant. 
we're seen as exclusive. Uh, we're not here at Brown, but most universities like us are seen as corrupt, uh, and um, <laughs> we're not. We're not. Uh, we're not. Uh, I won't comment on others. And um, and if you look at the polls, I mean, the polls, you know, the the vast majority of whether they're Republicans or Democrats feel like we're irrelevant, right? So that's the view, mm -hmm. and we have to actually become more relevant. Right? That's what's so important. People have to understand that universities like Brown are agents of social mobility and positive social change. That's what we're about. Mm -hmm. and, so, and if we can demonstrate that, then people will see that what we do is important. So how do we do that? And again, uh, building on uh, Chris's example, what we do as a university uh, is uh, we generate and we disseminate knowledge and we try to translate that into doing good things. And knowledge I see is sort of in two different broad camps. One is like timeless knowledge, laws of supply and demand, you know, uh, three faces of power or something like that, you know, that's timeless, it's always there. And then there's timely knowledge, like what's going on, you know, in the world right now and how do we understand that? And the way to understand that and make a difference is to actually, it's this interplay between the timeless and the timely. That's what we're trying to do. And that's where really good work does. And when we're doing that, then we can translate that knowledge into positive social change, whether it's in the medical area, whether in policy area, or things like that. That's what I think universities do when we're doing our, 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 be our best. And so let me just give you an example of something that might seem like truly theoretical, abstract, et cetera, but that actually is relevant. So I'm a, a, uh, a political economist. I spent a lot of time reading political theory, uh, and there's this Italian uh, Marxist uh, theorist, Antonio Gramsci, who was writing in the 1920s and 30s about hegemony, the the you know war of position versus uh, movement and stuff like that. Highly you know dense. You you know you got to sort of really you know slog it through uh, to get to the point. Why would that be important? to understand why this Italian exiled uh, Marxist theorist uh, would be relevant today. Well, it actually turns out that his theories are incredibly relevant to understand decolonization, uh, both in the real world and the decolonization of curriculum, et cetera. He gives us a set of categories to understand change. If we weren't studying that abstract theory from over a century ago, we wouldn't have the tools that would help us make the changes that we need now. So it's again, it's that interplay. So I think that that's an important thing. And I think what Brown is trying to do, which is great, is this whole engaged scholars program. Mm -hmm. That you know, in so many of our departments, our majors, people are learning the basic tools and theories and uh, content of the subject, and then translating it and working with community groups throughout mm -hmm. the city or throughout the country. That's exactly what Brown's trying to do, and I, I think that the more we do that, the more relevant uh, we are and the greater our impact and we can fulfill our mission. So I'm going to push that question a bit further. Um, as a, a staff member who, in her work, has time to engage with these different components, you know, how would you talk to staff whose um, positions might be, not be as flexible or they might not see themselves as a part of the, the scholarly life or the academic life of the institution? You know, what message would you give them about engaging in some of these conversations that might feel very student faculty centered and, um, and not necessarily include staff? Well, I, I think we, ha we have to make space where staff can engage in the academic mission. And you know, when I talk to staff, I, you know, I say, look, we are all, we're all part of the same mission. We're, we're advancing, communicating knowledge. That's what we do. And no matter what your role in the university, you're part of that. So I think having, helping people understand that they're, they're a, a vital part of this production mm -hmm. process of knowledge is really important. But, you know, as you said, creating opportunities, and whether it's on days like this, professional development days, mm -hmm. whether it's through uh, faculty uh, staff seminars, whether it's through all, you know, different kinds of things, professional development opportunities, mm -hmm. I think staff can become more engaged in the academic life of the, of the, of the community. And I think it gives more of a sense of connection to what we're doing. 
Yeah. Again, let me just build on this. I mean, we've done a couple things, um, you know, whether it's the faculty in focus uh, seminar series where faculty present research to staff, sold out instantly, uh, and people really engage it. The first uh, readings uh, seminars oh. that used to only be for students coming in, now we're for yeah. staff, sold out uh, right away. Um, and uh, what's so amazing about, uh, you know, Brown is that everyone's here because they're engaged in the academic mission. They believe in the purpose of this uh, university. And, and I think Chris has made it one of her three key priorities is to strengthen our community. And the way to do that is to create the space and the respect f between faculty and, uh, and staff, students and uh, staff, et cetera, so that people feel like they can lean in and participate. So if we can create more of the space, which Chris has already done, but there's a lot more that we can do, uh, then I think people will come to work with a bounce in their step. Mm -hmm. And if they come to work with a bounce in the step, we can actually fulfill our mission. Yeah. Professional development, I think, is really important, too. And this is something, you know, we just launched the Leadership Institute, HR is working on a lot of other professional development opportunities. We're a learning community. That's what a university is. And it shouldn't be, oh, the faculty and the students are learning and the staff are not. Mm -hmm. We all have to learn. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, building stronger professional development programs over time, we've been doing a lot, we can do more. Mm -hmm. I'm very excited about that. And so I, I have another uh, question, and I, I do want to be mindful of our time together. And I think this question is really, it's phrased as a question, but I think it's a statement here, which is. Um, <laughs> We're used to that. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to be like, I'm just, read it. I'm just, just read reading. It. I'm just, just read reading. I'm just reading, right? <laughs> Um, and the, so the question is, what is the best way to get my department to participate in, in diversity and inclusion opportunities? Because in most cases, people who are engaged are those who are already deeply committed to this work. So how can we ensure that all community members take part in building an inclusive community? Or shortcut, how can everyone do work? I, I think that's actually, that is, yeah. a, is a statement, but it's also a great <laughs> question. And it's one of the hardest things. I, I guess I would say you have to be really creative and you have to make people want to come to things, right? And that means thinking from their point of view, right? Mm -hmm. What would make the person who I really want to have come in, come in, want to come into the room? Mm -hmm. And it may be approaching things through an academic lens, where let's read this really high quality research and talk about it, maybe. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's having a really great happy hour at the end of the event, right? I, no, I'm serious. You, 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 you want it, you know, again, you have to get out of yourself, look at it from the outside and say, what's going to make this work? And you know, one trick I like to use is if I'm planning an event, and I do this sometimes with the corporation, somebody who I want to be engaged who isn't, I'll ask them to be a presenter. Mm. Right? <laughs> so, okay, it works. Right? <laughs> like you got to be in the room if you've been asked to be a presenter. Right. And it also means that you have to start buying into the subject. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of it, creativity, yeah. a key. <laughs> have you, do you have any other good tricks? <laughs> Um, no, I think we've learned over the last couple of years. I mean, the, again, uh, when we developed uh, the Diversity Inclusion Action Plan, um, a big discussion was, are we going to have mandatory you know, anti-racist training? Are we going to do these things? And we made a decision, collectively, a group, that it was better to do opt-in that the research showed that people coming voluntarily, so create lots of different options, have people opt in, and they would get it. And professional development day being one of the many other things that we do. Like we do a lot of these retreats for all the department chairs, all the DGSs, et cetera. We're doing a lot of this kind of work. But still, most of the people who come are the people who are inclined to come. And, um, and so I think that that was a good first step. You know, like you want to sort of uh, go for the low-hanging fruit uh, and, and, and the middle. Um, and I think now what we're beginning to think about is, do we go into the departments that we believe need work mm -hmm. and make sure that everyone is engaged in that? And I think working with OIED, so again, have the carrots, you know, and lots of different options that people can lean into. Mm -hmm. And then maybe now, um, since we're hearing that, especially in terms of the inclusion part mm -hmm. and the climate part, it's, it's 
uh, difficult, then maybe we need to go in there and work with each of the departments to make sure that everyone is involved. And so I think that's the next stage. How would you answer that question? How would I answer that question? Um, I think. Am I allowed to ask you questions? <laughs> You're the president. So okay. You are allowed. I can do it. <laughs> and um, she said she invites people to present when she wants to. I don't know what that means. Right? Um, you know, I, th I think that we shouldn't worry too much about those who are not engaging, um, you know, because you, you can't make someone believe a particular way or. Um, do things in the way that we always want them to, to do. And so I think I wouldn't focus that much on that population, but I would make sure that our leadership isn't drawn from the population that's not engaging, right? And so how are we putting people in different spaces? Who are we hiring? Who are we allowing to sit around the table to really set the, the chart, the course, and to, to engage in that behavior? I think that's where we start, right? Um, a trick that I gave a department chair is um, if you want faculty to fully engage in conversations, any meeting that you're going to make a decision, that's where you bring the diversity conversation. And you have it at the beginning of the meeting and not the end of the meeting. So that way everyone is at least hearing these messages, you're setting the expectations. And so I think you build it into your every day mm -hmm. versus these training and these one-off moments. And yeah, so I point. think that's what I would do. Yeah. Um, and I, I love, you gotta have a carrot and you gotta have a stick. So thank you for saying that. The provost said it. You got it. You got to do this work, right? <laughs> <laughs> and there's some accountability around it. But I also find diversity work joyful, right? Yeah. It's fatiguing. It's 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 hard, but it's wonderful and it's joyful. And so how do we bring our full consciousness to that? It's really important. Yeah. Um, all right. So I think we are at the the end of um, our session, and so I, I just want to sort of echo some points around our diversity and inclusion action planning because I really do like this model of. Um, engaging and embedding community for every, um, in diversity and inclusion for everyone. And that it really, it takes all of us, right? It takes the entire village to engage and also sustain the inclusive community that we wanna um, be. And it takes strong leadership. And so I really wanna thank you both thank you. For, for setting that tone and that expectation and the capacity for us to do that. And then I also just wanna thank you for being up in the bright lights with me <laughs> um, to talk about your journey and to talk about um, how we can continue to do this work together. And so will you please join me in thanking our president. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and so um, I think we can sit for one more minute. And I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Ryan. Absolutely, thank you, Renee, for posing those very thoughtful questions and to President Paxton and Provost Locke for giving us insight into your lives, ideas, and what is effectively our collective responsibility to transform Brown into an optimally inclusive space to both, well, live, work, and learn, three things. Um, I wanna close our time together by touching on, at least in this space, um, a few logistical items before we transition. First, uh, we want to make sure that we're continually meeting the needs of the Brown community. And so by the end of the day, you'll receive an evaluation from the Office of Institutional Equity and Diversity that invites you to respond to a number of prompts that will ultimately sh shape our plans for similar events in the future. Um, our goal, to nobody's surprise, is 100% response rate. So please make sure to do your part in helping us meet that goal. Um, and then please share your, so your thoughts um, um, as soon as you get the survey. Second, all registrants selected to attend a specific breakout session as our next session. So with reserved space in mind in each of the rooms, please be sure to attend the session for which you registered. And then lastly, but certainly not least, uh, lunch, bag lunches are in the back of Solomon. And feel free to pick up your bag lunch on the way to your next session. We have a little bit of time, but if you run short of time in between grabbing your lunch and heading to the next session, feel free to eat your lunch in the next session. All right, so thanks again, appreciate it.